right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Tyler Elliston, who is in Austin, Texas. How are you doing, Tyler? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Tyler's a growth advisor and he is the founder and marketing strategist for Right Side Up, a uh, collective of premium marketing talent. And what we're going to talk about today is marketing to find your product slash market fit versus growth. So let's get right into it. what do you mean by product market fit versus growth? Yeah, so a lot, a lot of early stage companies uh, look to advertising to grow. Um, sometimes that happens before the product is really ready for it is, you know, before mm -hmm. you've really got customers that um, have validated that okay, I have a problem, this solution solves my problem, I'm willing to pay what you need me to pay in order for all the economics to work. And so generally, you know, we'll, we'll kind of categorize some performance marketing or marketing for pre-product market fit when you're trying to figure it out and just sort of nail the solution. And then a different set of sort of marketing tactics for when you're ready to really grow. And I think confusing which stage you're in is one of the most common uh, those common challenges we see entrepreneurs have. Yeah, and and it's almost like it's 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 encouraged in many ways, isn't it? Like oh, you know, just get get up here, you know, your minimum viable product, get that up and running, and then do. But then 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 go to town on the marketing and try and yes. and and as you said, market try and grow as fast as you can or whatever. Uh, yes. But the problem is that a lot of the solutions are either you know half baked or they're or they're not mapped to any as you said to any particular. Um, market need in the right way. Yes, yes, exactly. And it, and it is, um, uh, as somebody who's, you know, I've started a company, I've raised venture mm -hmm. capital, you know, you feel this intense pressure because it's like, okay, I've raised this money. I have a two year runway or 18 month runway and I have to get to here in that time. And so it's very natural to just say, all right, you know, we need to go five steps forward. Um, and, and, you know, certainly your investors are, are, are wanting you to move as quickly as possible. So it can be quite hard to mm -hmm. sort of put up some guardrails and say, okay, yes, but not yet. Let's first focus on the customer and really nail the solution. So what are some of the things that you would do differently when you're marketing for, 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 product, um, for product and market as opposed, you know, fit? What are some of the things you would do differently than you would be if you were just going full on for growth? Yes. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing with, with that first stage of finding product market fit is really a close connection to the customer. And so oftentimes that's like, you know, we, you know, we kind of bucket it, bucket it as product marketing, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, doing user research, interviews, surveys, focus groups, um, understanding what their problem is, putting a solution in front of them, watching them uh, use that solution, taking notes, iterating on the product, um, so a lot of it is, is really extremely customer centric and it is very experimental in nature. Um, a lot of times companies will still use like paid advertising, but it's not to grow. It's just to get those first people into the funnel so that you have somebody to talk to. <laughs> right, and, right. Uh, and so it's, it's paid as a very small component of that phase. Whereas um, in that growth phase, once you really nail the solution, you know, then often that's when you see paid advertising really become a bigger part of, of, of the marketing focus. And it's certainly reasonable for that to, for that to happen for, for businesses in most industries. So, some paid will never be a huge component, but, but those are the biggest mm -hmm. differences I think between those stages. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because what you've outlined there, it's, um, it's a lot of detailed and it's a lot of detailed work. It's a lot of very focused work. Um, it's a lot of data gathering and analysis and, Sometimes, let's face it, sometimes these are not the most exciting things that people want to go, oh, I can let me let's just launch Google ad campaigns because then yeah, we can just right. watch this stuff in our in our dashboards. Um, this yes. requires this. So this is quite it's quite intense, focused work. And maybe, as I said to some people, maybe not the most exciting, but critical. Yes. And well, I think that, um, you know, you, you hear these these anecdotes from advisors um, and luminaries suggesting that the people who are really successful as entrepreneurs are those that have experienced the problem themselves. 
um, right? Or they're just on a mission, mm -hmm. like something, something happened in their life or career that led them to become very passionate about, you know, this problem. And I think the way that I've sort of reconciled that with this topic is finding that, that early product market fit and doing that user research. It, it, it is so much easier when you are that customer, like you yeah. are talking to people like yourself who have had the problem that you have had, or you're just absolutely passionate about it, you know, and it's, and you frankly don't even care if it scales, you just want to solve that stinking problem. And, and so I think that that really um, uh, speaks to, as from an entrepreneur standpoint, like which business do you pursue? Pursue the yeah. one that you will be excited to go and, you know, talk, talk to these customers about it. Yeah, no, it's a great point because I even if I think on the on the pipeline or CRM side of, of, of our business is um, the founder, uh, Nicholas Kimla, he was an Austrian, just sold his other business. Uh, he 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 came in accidentally came into the CRM space for that reason because he couldn't find a CRM that solved the issues that he was looking to solve and then I joined he invited me in and I joined again because the CRM did something that I couldn't solve with other CRMs in the companies that I had run before so to your point is and then we invested a long, long time and a lot of month, time and energy and money in product development as opposed to marketing. Um, and, yes. and so we, we've kind of followed the model of you. So it's, it is really interesting just to underline that with some anecdotal evidence here is that's exactly the way it came about for us. And I do think that's that's a great way to approach it. If you're solving a problem for yourself, uh, it, chances are it's not you're not the only one in the world who has that problem. Yes. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And the, the odds of, of finding product market fit are exponentially higher when, like in that example, it's been personally felt. Um, and so you know how to start to solve it. Yeah. And then and then obviously, um, you, you, you have to make smart decisions based on the market research and the, the feedback that you're getting getting from the market. How do you yes. how do you make sure when you're going through this process that you're not, you're not maybe you're doing it properly and you're not maybe confirming things that you want to confirm as opposed to getting real honest input. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think, I think, you know, well, so a, a couple of points here, one, a caveat, I'm not an expert in user research. Sure. And I think that actually is one of the things that I've come to really value is having an advisor or someone that you can lean on that actually does know how to, to do this and identify biases Certainly, you know, there's a lot of literature out there about how to avoid biases in surveys, um, questioning for focus groups. Um, I mean, honestly, just observing, observing people, you know, putting it in front of them and, and watching how they interact and then asking them very simple questions like, you know, did this solve your problem on a scale from one to 10? To what extent did it mm -hmm. solve your problem? Would you recommend this to somebody else? Would you pay X dollars? Um, you know, very very simple and, and ideally very data driven versus, um, uh, you know, versus really relational. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a place for both, but I think getting that sort of data driven, uh, you know, input on their willingness to spend, you know, is super critical. And what do you think is one uh, are some of the most underutilized marketing tactics for this phase? Well, <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, uh, in some ways, not a great answer. And in another way, is the, is the perfect answer. Hmm. Uh, it, it's like picking up the phone and talking to people. Uh, like like that is that is the number one skill required, activity required. Like it's not it's not crazy a talk. <laughs> uh, right, right, right. It's uh, seriously. I mean, it's like it's like when you, if you say to people like you pick up the phone and talk to people, they now go. <laughs> right, right, Why right. Do I do that? <laughs> right, yeah. I, I, I think about with my with my children, you know, mm -hmm. as they want devices. I'm like, what what skill is going to be unique in 20 years when they're like coming of age? It's like, ah, right, like talking to people. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, uh, but but yeah, I think that I think that is it. It's not it's not about a technology. It's not about a super special like detailed skill like Google AdWords. It is, it is talking to people and trying to help them in a fundamental way through, through a solution. Um, 
yeah. yeah and, and unfortunately we uh, unfortunately we live in a world now where it always see it seems that you know technology is a fantastic enabler but it's not a replacement for everything and i think and it, and and there are things that humans can do that technology can support but not replace and i think that's that's a key point here is by you know picking up the phone and interacting with people and i also think that you know given the fact that we've been through this whole pandemic and all of that i think there's a greater hunger for people to have those type of conversations and interactions so this yes. may be a fantastic time for you if you have if you've been avoiding picking up the phone or you've been like just uh, satisfied with using technology for everything now is maybe the best chance you have to to balance things out a little bit absolutely absolutely and i think you know it's I, it's been an interesting thought experiment the last six months i've thought about um the relationship between marketing and sales and a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of what i'm advocating is you know one-to-one -one, pick up the phone like that sounds like sales but, but the way that it ties to marketing, the way I see it is, you know, that's how you, that's how you develop your messaging. That's how you develop your positioning. And in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, marketing is simply translating what you learn in a one-to-one -one setting and then doing it in a one-to-many setting, mm -hmm. you know, saying the same thing, but instead of saying it in a conversation with a person, you're saying it in your ad copy on a Facebook ad, right? And you know, it works because you've, you've given it. 30 times before. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a I think that's a key point especially about sales and marketing alignment uh, today because yeah, I mean that sounds a lot more like like sales doing the one-on-one, -on -one, but it's it's also it's a good experience for the marketing person to do that. And also if you think about sales today, you know, they have to be able to do micro marketing campaigns. So there's a lot of there it's kind of fluid if you like, you know, and overlaps a lot more than it than it used to and that's why I think you know, sales people need to learn some micro marketing uh, skills and marketing people need to learn some relationship building skills. Yes, yes. And I think in that early stage, it really is, you know, if we call that one to one, if we call that sales, mm -hmm. it really is about that, you know, the micro selling and the product, you know, yeah. it's really not about, you know, marketing in the sense of big programs and, and scale. And then I think as you get to later stage, and the product is, is really stable and you're just doing little feature tweaks, but the core value prop is consistent and the sales is locked in, you know, then marketing becomes a lot more important. But uh, even as a marketer, I'll be the first to admit, it's, it's just not, it's not the answer in the earliest phases. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. And the other thing I think is it starts to help marketing to understand uh, business use cases a lot better because one of, one of the things, and, and you've probably seen this many times, is uh, when you start off with some of the some of the way you target or message, you know, particular product, but when it gets into the hands of the users then they start using it in ways that you didn't think they would. And they don't use it in some of the ways you thought they would. And yes. therefore understanding that and understanding the business reasons why they're using your product in the way yes. that they are can be, can be just golden. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and hopefully even in a later stage context, there are sort of remnants of framework in place from that, those customer feedback loops mm -hmm. from that, from that, you know, early stage so that you can respond to those. I think, you know, a lot of late stage companies that we see uh, that kind of lose their way. One of the common reasons for that is because they, they sort of lose that muscle of yeah. talking to customers and getting that sort of feedback you're talking about. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Because uh, I mean, sometimes companies get to a stage you know, where it's all focused on new business acquisition, and they kind of take their install base for granted. And to your point yes. that that they lose the innovation, uh, the innovation, um, um, innovative approach, because they are just so focused on growth at that stage, and they're no longer focused yes. on really understanding the needs of the, the evolving needs of their customers. Yes. And that applies cross-functionally, right? Like marketing mm -hmm. can't lose its muscle on customer research sales, like not, you know, not forgetting to listen <laughs> to the yeah. problem before selling, you know, it's, it, it really is, uh, it's something that we often see kind of a top down culture attribute, yeah. um, or, or lacking. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think most people, everything, uh, everything comes from top down in the end. I mean, cause that's where people take their cues from. Yes, uh, and, and whatever is important, you know, I mean, whatever is important to the person you report it, it tends to be top of the priorities for yourself. Yep, exactly. 
So, um, so just changing gears slightly, um, what do you see? Uh, what do you see for the future of, of marketing and, and product marketing? What are, are there any things on the horizon you think people should be paying attention to? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that I think the core, you know, the, the early stage stuff, finding product market fit. Um, to me, that is very, it's very organic. It's very human centric. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't, I don't see that. I don't see that changing. You know, I think that is, that is just how, you know, innovation happens, um, you know, often uh, on the, on the growth side, of course, things are, things are always changing. Um, you know, we hear a lot of companies wanting to diversify away from Facebook. They're scared about mm -hmm. the impacts of IDFA um you know in the new ios like they're they're shifting you know everybody wants to test tiktok <laughs> yeah. uh, you know and, and see if that works so certainly like you know marketing channels paid channels uh you know that landscape is is ever evolving um and, and certainly even like paid versus non-paid tactics uh, mm -hmm. but but yeah i, th I think that i think the, the the framework is consistent yeah, yeah, and and obviously, I mean, you have to figure out. I mean, like TikTok's a great example. Uh, you have to figure out: is your customer on TikTok? Is is yes. it going to help you in any way, um, or 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 do you just think, hey, it's a fun thing to do, makes us look a little bit quirky and funky, so it's it's a nice add-on. So from that point of view, it's a good thing to do. But I think you have yes. to go in. You have to go in with your eyes open, what you're looking to achieve, and in, in in every channel. Yes, yes. And, it, and it's, you know, most companies that we talk to and work with, it, it's, it's, it's all an exercise in allocating limited resources, yeah, you know, exactly. limited people, limited money. And so it's just, yeah, the, the, the bar is, has always got to be high to go into any new channel, which I think requires that clear, clear, clear mindedness you're referencing. Yeah, no, it does because let's face it. I mean, there's so many different things that you could focus on, and so many different channels that you could go yes. into. That you could you could spread not just spread your 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 funds, uh, your budget very thin, but your focus, which I think is almost more important. Yes, I mean, certainly, I can I can speak for myself as a you know when I started a company and raised venture capital that ended up failing, <laughs> which was still you know, I, I struggled so much to. You know, I knew that there was some value in focus, but I didn't know what to focus on. Right. Because I didn't know what to focus on, I wanted to try everything, and and that was you know that's a really tough spot to be in. But it, it that does not um, that is not that that commonly leads to success, uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, absolutely. All right. Well, listen, this has been great. Thank you so much, Tyler, for your time today. Uh, all of Tyler's yes. information is going to be below the video, uh, all the links so you can find out about Tyler. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company. Yeah. So, um, so Right Side Up is a consultancy I started about five years ago. We work primarily with venture-backed high-growth companies in Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, New York. Um, certainly not limited to those geos, but that's where, where most of them are. And we're helping all of them, regardless of stage, with one thing, growth. So mm -hmm. whether that's through, you know, paid advertising, content marketing, or something else, uh, you know, we're, we're helping them both strategically and then also, you know, our team members are being deployed, you know, in the trenches with our clients to actually execute. Perfect. Um, listen, again, thank you so much, Tyler, for today. Great information. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.